Constable, we appreciate you uh, agreeing to do the podcast on on a Friday, man. Thank you, thank you man. for for you know uh, letting me be part of this deal. I'd, I'd never, I've never done a podcast before. Really? Really? Never. I imagine you've done some TV interviews. I've done some here. TV interviews. You know, I've done some uh, recording, and we do PSAs and all of that. Yeah. You know, and uh, but not an actual podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, for our listeners, can you introduce yourself and let everyone know what precinct you worked in? And, and you got an accomplished career too. So a list, you know, how long you've been in the game? Absolutely. So my name is uh, Carlos Lopez, and I am the Travis County Constable for Precinct Number Five. We have five constables here in Travis County, and I am the Central. Uh, courthouse constable, if you will. Uh, it is the largest constable's office. As a matter of fact, the largest constable's office probably in the state in the central Texas wow. area. Um, I have uh, I've been I've been here for forty five years. Mm. I know what you're thinking. How can that be? You know, you look so young. <laughs> you right? do, man. You actually really do. You look young. <laughs> no, I joke about that all the time. But uh, I actually started across the street over at the uh, Justice of the Peace office. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was going to ACC and all that at the time, and I was married and all that. And uh, 45 years later, uh, here I am. But I did move from the uh, JP office over to the constable's office, and I've been through like five different elected officials since I've been yeah. here. And people are saying, well, you know, you just got reelected. I say, I got just, I'm in my third term. Mm. Every four years, you got to run for office. So I'll, I'm, I'm in my, in my third term first year. So I have three years to go on this, on this uh, term. And I run every four years and people say, why, well, you know, aren't you like ready to retire? You're like 45 years, man. And I was like, well, you know, I'd really like to reach 50 years here wow. in Travis County, you know. So uh, if I run a, again another term, you know, I'll make that 50 years. So I'm, I'm, I'm planning on it, you know, Lord willing, creek don't rise, like I say. But uh, that's a heck of a career, 50 years, you know, 45 years right now. Yeah, yeah. Um Obviously, you have a great passion for it, and you don't look like you're burned out or anything. So. Well, I, you know, I'm not. I love it. I love doing what I what I do. Uh, you know, of course, the, the the best question that I that I ever get from folks is like, "What is a constable?" Because I don't know what a constable does. That's know? our next question. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love I love to answer, you know, that question because, you know, I'm I'm involved in many things around the state of Texas. You know, I've been past president of the Justices of the Peace and Constables Association of the state of Texas. And that's the largest organization with the most elected officials in the state. So, yeah, it, which consists of JPs, Justices of the Peace, and constables. So, being past president, you have like a five-year commitment and all that. So, you get to travel all over the state of Texas and talk to constables, talk to judges and JPs and see what their issues are around the state. I'm also an instructor for the constable. So when a newly elected constable, you know, uh, takes office, we'll go and train them at the uh, Sam Houston State University. And they have continuing education at the Texas Justice Court Training Center, which is out of Southwest Texas State. So I get to meet so many folks. And and comparatively speaking, I mean, I've got the best job in the world. I, I hate to say that. I don't, you know, it's a, it's a well-kept secret you know, in law enforcement, because constables around the state are are very unique, and but yet they're very different from the other law enforcement officers. Now, they're peace, we're peace officers. If you look at the Code of Criminal Procedures 212, it explains all of the all of the peace officers in the state of Texas. Constables, Texas constables are one of them, and so we're elected, you know, by the people in our precinct. Um, mine is Central Austin. I have UT, I have 6th Street, I have downtown, I have all the way all up, up to almost 620. Oh. And it's a huge area. But only the folks that live in your precinct will elect you. Now, that, that means that, um, that I am a peace officer, for one, but I'm also an elected official. And along with that comes a huge responsibility, you know, to the taxpayers, to the citizens and all that. Depending on where you're at, whether you're in uh, in Williamson County or you're in uh, up in Nacogdoches, or depending on where the constable lives, 
determines on what the uh, the actual work is in there. Primarily, we are it's a constitutional office, so we are in charge of our justice of the peace court, which is our JP judge. Okay, Nick Chu is our judge over here, right across the street, and we handle everything that comes out of the JP court: small claims, lawsuits, subpoenas. We did a lot of evictions, and now they're picking up after the COVID and all that. They started yeah. opening up. So, uh, I mean, we had 60 cases in one day that they heard, you know, so I don't know how many people of those are going to be evicted. But that's kind of primarily is is we we also bailiff for the court. So when, when they have court, we have a bailiff in there and all that. Now, just just because we, we, we take care of our JP court, uh, our, uh, our job doesn't end there. We also have to uh, are responsible for any process that comes out of the county courts and any process that comes out of the district courts mm-hmm. as well. So we have district, county, JP, and, and then we get everything comes out from out of county and send it primarily. There's a lot of them use my office because we're, we're the courthouse constable. And so they send a lot of the process here. So we go out and we serve process, and we basically deliver it to to the individual that's named. And for the most part, it is a notice initially. It's a notice that you're being sued or you're being evicted or you know any of that. But we're also responsible for enforcing judgments. You know, when when you file a lawsuit. You win your case. Well, I mean, how do you get your money now, right? Mm. So they issue these court orders or these processes where we have to go out and collect the money for the plaintiff that, you know, they won their case. I mean, they've been going through all this, and now they want their money. So sometimes we have to go out and seize property that belongs to the person that owes the money. Mm. Now there's a lot of, you know, legal, you know, uh, exemptions and whatnot but seizing property is one of the things that we do quite a bit if it's not because of the uh, judgment enforcement it is because of a court order that we receive from the district court or the county court that says you need to gmac would try to repossess this car and they came out with a gun so now they issued this writ of sequestration and we need you to go out and get it <laughs> so we'll go out and get it so we'll actually seize the vehicle, holding our possession. But there's other property. Just to, that was just an example of some of the court orders that we get. What um, what we deal with here in Travis County, in my precinct especially, because I have a family unit that specializes in family law. So uh, what I mean by that is that if you're in a uh, divorce proceeding, we're going to serve you the divorce paper. And now you're in a custody battle with with your kid, but you know, trying to fight over the kids. And now we got a court order that says you have to go attach that child from one parent and to give it to the other. Ooh, that's tough. You know? And that the child attachments are the toughest things. One of the toughest things we do. So out of the family court, it comes the child attachments, right? And we do that. And but a lot of the the. Uh, child attachments that we've been uh, receiving here recently have, are coming from CPS cases. Mm. So CPS will go to the court, says the child is in danger. The child needs to be removed from the home. Uh, so we need a constable to go out and, and attach the child. So you can imagine if somebody comes to your door, knocks on your door, and says, you know, I'm here to, to take possession of your child. You know, and many times it's like, well, you and what army, you know? Yeah. Because, I mean, fight's on. That That's probably the most dangerous um, encounter that a, a police officer can have, right? When it's, Absolutely. when when there's something going on at the house, yeah. right? Oh, hey. This podcast episode is brought to you by BCN Supplements. BCN Supplements is a Texas-based company that produces and manufactures everything right here in the great United States of America. The good thing is BCN caters to every single person on the fitness spectrum. Whether you're a seasoned hybrid athlete, kind of like myself, or you're a newbie just now starting to pay attention to your health, kind of like Mike, BCN has what you need to make a healthy choice. Lately, 
I've been using BCN's pre-workout mix. And to be honest, I'm not really a pre-workout guy because I don't like the way most on the market make you feel. You know, the crash and that tingly feeling. But you don't get any of that junk with BCN's pre-workout mix. I've noticed I had more focus during my lifts and more energy to carry through my longer workouts. And that pump you get is just, it's amazing. Drop what you're doing right now and go to bcnsubs.com to place your order today on this pre-workout mix. They got vitamins and they got collagen. And be sure to use promo code CWJM to receive 10% off your next purchase. BCN Supplements, helping build a better you from the inside out. Usually, if it's a domestic situation, especially with that, and, 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 and just, you know, continue to discuss about the child attachments, um, that's very difficult to do. And so one of the things I need to explain to our listeners is that my office, although I'm the largest office here, I don't have any uniform officers. Mm. As a matter of fact, I don't have any marked units. What we have found throughout the years, and I've been here again 45 years, what works for us is to be in plain clothes in a plain uh, unit, unmarked unit. It's a softer approach, and believe it or not, it works. People appreciate that a whole lot. You know, when you're going to somebody's home, you know, the neighbors, everybody's watching. You know, people appreciate you not going out there, you know, gun-toting and all badge and uniform and all that they do appreciate that what's important the most important for my office is to is to hire the right people yeah. hire the right people because again you know i don't need a hot shot deputy with a gun and a badge that says you know because i said so you know now especially especially in volatile situations such as a child attachment you know you have to be able to talk to these people you have to make them understand that it's a temporary situation. You have recourse, you know, and as we're doing here because the court felt that this was the best, you know, for the child. It's in the child's best interest. So, you know, there's a lot of that, you know, skill set that our officers have to have. You have to have the right personality. Yeah. You have to have the right person, you know, for the job. On that, on that subject of training, especially now yes. with uh, all the news stories you hear about, you know, the police incidents, everyone has a cell phone these days. So I imagine stuff's being captured a lot easy, a lot easier with cell phones. But there's a big talk, um, you know, on the national level of upping the police training that cadets get um, and peace officers get. Are, are you involved in any of that? Because... Well, here's here's the thing that we do our own training because I mean, the folks that we hire already are already certified peace officers. We don't send them to the school and the, and the training academy and all that. So we're looking for experienced officers. A lot of folks that we we get here are from other departments. Uh, could be the sheriff's office, could be another police department, could be another constable's office. You know, so the folks that we get already certified and already trained. Well. That's fine and good. Again, what we're looking for is a person's um, personality, you know, their attitude, uh, their background. What are they involved in? I want to know what you do for a hobby. You know, yeah. I want to do what you do outside. You know, what, you know, that kind of thing. So you can always train someone, but you got to have the right person to do it. And and so far, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna tell you. Knock on wood, man, we have been so fortunate to have, you know, I mean, the best officers out here, best deputies that are well-trained. Of course, we have continuing training. So we go through an, uh, what we call FTO program, the field training officer program, internally. Okay. So I don't care how long it takes. It's three months. It's four months. You know, you're going to ride with someone. You're going to go and observe how we knock on the door, how we speak to people how we re interact, you know, how we deal with the children. I mean, we have a room back here, the conference room. You saw that. We have stuffed animals. We have video games. We have all kinds of things because sometimes we've got to bring them over here and wait for the court to make a decision. Mm. So we're prepared for all of that. So we specialize in this. And we had a record number of, of child attachments this, this last year that we, you know, 
And I don't know if it was because of the COVID and because of that. And but um, but we did have a record number of, of child attachments. A lot of them were CPS cases, unfortunately, and then a lot of them were uh, custody cases, you know, as well. What happens is they go during the holidays. They go to Thanksgiving, and they, you know, it's their somebody's turn to take the child, and then all of a sudden they don't want to go back, and you know, there's allegations that come up, and of course we got to deal with those allegations and flush them out and make sure that you know that every that the child is in good, you know, and 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 go through it, and we vet it all, and uh, and then we have to return the child, you know. So you know, it it it's very volatile but we're very proud of the of our family unit that we have here because that's just part of my family unit the other part the child attachments is one factor of action of it but the other is the domestic violence protective orders mm. we serve pretty much all of the domestic violence and and but let me back up a little bit because in many precincts around the state you stay within your precinct that you're elected we don't we do countywide we do countywide, and as a matter of fact, we have the authority and jurisdiction to serve process in our contiguous counties right outside our county. We go to Burnett. We go to Burnett. We can go to Hayes County. We can go. We can do that. We have the, the authority and jurisdiction to do that in these civil cases, okay? So we do countywide. So as a result, you know, we ended up with the, um, with the family violence. Now, I'm a member of the Austin slash Travis County Family Violence Task Force here in Austin. The task force gets together and they, you know, and they figure out how to prevent fam- domestic violence and they, they figure all these things. But, you know, the main reason I, I joined is because I serve all these protective orders. So I get a protective order from family court to go serve this individual, a domestic violence protective order, and saying you, you need to refrain from you know, uh, family violence. And sometimes uh, they're excluded from the residence as well, mm. which is interesting. Yeah. Because um, we go up there and says, uh, hey, John, how you doing? You know, we serve the paper and says, uh, oh, by the way, there's an exclusion of residence there. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to give you like 15 minutes to get whatever possessions you have, immediate that you need for immediate leads, and then you're going to have to leave. Well, what if I don't? Well, if you don't, then I'm going to escort you and give you a free ride to jail mm. because you would be in violation of a, of a protective order, and I'll charge you with that, and I'll have to transport you to jail. So you're going to leave anyway, right? So they do, and believe it or not, we've had no issues, very, very few issues. And Again, I think it's how you approach people. You know, you approach people and how you talk to people with respect. And I think that works. It goes a long way. Again, we're not uniformed and all that. We just kind of explain how is, things Is work. that a department policy that, that you've put in place of not to wear uniforms or? That's correct. Okay. That's, is, my, are, that's my choice. Is that um, yeah. unique uh, related to the other constables? Uh, most of the other constables are, war, are uniform officers. Okay. They have um, marked units. Mm. They do traffic. I, I don't, you know, uh, which we, I, which is another topic <laughs> of discussion, which, you know, which we can get into later because Austin Police Department wants us to do traffic because they're not, they don't have a traffic unit anymore. Guess what? Yeah. Anyway, we digress <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting uh, turn of events here. But, um, but, you know, generally speaking, you know, my office deals with civil process. Now, don't get me wrong. We, we do arrest people on warrants. If it's a, a family assault case, for example, that a warrant is issued along with the domestic violence protective order, we'll go ahead and execute that as well. So we do have a warrant unit that has to go out. Now, let me tell you, the Class C misdemeanor warrants, we don't arrest anybody. Mm. We just don't, you know, not going to. Um, they're misdemeanor charges. We, if, if there is a, a slew of warrants that comes in, what we'll do is we'll send them a postcard and say, Hey, just by the way, you got this out there. You need to take care of it because I may not arrest you, but I'm going to tell you some, some other department, police department, they pull you over. You're, you're probably going to jail. Mm. 
I mean, I'm not saying that you will, but I'm just saying there's a possibility of that. So take care of it. Yeah. That's all we do. Okay. Do y'all have a, a standard, you know, you go and talk to these people and some of them get aggressive. Do you have like a standardized way of talking, like a flow chart, basically, if they're... Yeah, it's de-escalation, basically. You know, uh, you know, we we do we take training on on they used to call it verbal judo and de-escalation and and all of that and 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 you can de-escalate folks. I mean, unless they're intoxicated or there's mental health issues that there's nothing you can do except you know deal with the individual. In most cases, it works. Really? <laughs> yeah. It really does. I mean, you talk to people, say, "Hey, calm down. Wait a minute." You know, I went and served a, uh, a an eviction on this family, and it was before Christmas. You did personally? Yes. You still? I mean, it was years st- ago. Okay, okay. I, not years ago. I okay. mean, you know, I have people now that yeah. go out and do that. If I got to go out there and do it, I'm like, something well, dangerous going, going on, wrong. right? <laughs> Someone some get fired. Management <laughs> going on. No, but I get out there, you know, and and I don't mind. But you know, I I served personally a an eviction one time. And I, t- I was explaining to the to the gentleman and all that, and he got real upset, and he started crying, and he started yelling, and his kids started crying, and he picked up the the little Christmas tree that he had, and he picked it up and he threw it out the door, and he says, "You know why you can have it?" And he was just went off, you know, and just like upset. So it's like, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, come on, come on. Let me, let me explain something. You're not moving right now. You're not moving right now. You know, so his techniques that you use is, look, let me explain to you what's going to happen. All right? Let me take, give you the time frame that happens as well. Yeah. You haven't said, besides, there's some folks that you can call for assistance, especially now we got COVID and all that, and, and people are getting kicked out like crazy. There's a form here. You, this is, these people will help you with your rent or whatever it is that you need. Okay. And so, you know, you start coming down a little bit. I mean, you know, and I've had them where the child attachments, the same thing. You know, I personally used to do them all. You know, I had a gun pull out you know, on me, you know, mm-hmm. when I was doing a child attachment by, by a bandito. Oh, wow. Motorcycle guy. Gosh. Yeah. And I'll tell you something about, you know, freaking out and, mm-hmm. and seeing your, you know, seeing your life just go before you kind of thing. That happened to me, you know. Thank goodness that the guy was calm enough to say, look, I didn't point it at you, but I knew that something was going to happen to my child, so I carried this gun with me everywhere I went. It was a forty-five, you know, shiny, silver, you know, chrome, whatever, like, uh, <laughs> and you reach for yours, you know, because I, I had concealed. I don't, you know, when I was working out in the field, I would conceal. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a softer approach. I mean, people, when I say softer approach, I think some people get it, you yeah. know. I think most people get it, uh, and it works for us, you know. So it, depending on what we do, whether it's a domestic violence uh, protective order, and we do civil standbys, for example, if it's on a, uh, a Saturday and a victim needs to go and get their, you know, their things or personal processions out and just immediate, we'll go with them and help them get them out, yeah. you know. We had court orders that, that also, you know, orders us, you know, order, order us to do that. But but generally speaking, in a nutshell, that's kind of what we do. Now, we do other things. Yeah. Okay? But in a nutshell, uh, the constable is responsible for, for doing those, those uh, you know, those requests, those orders, those papers, you know. And people say, well, you're just kind of a paper pusher. No, it's a little bit more than that. Mm. I learned the hard way when, when I went to the uh, to the police academy at the very beginning because my constable kept asking me, hey, I'm, you know, I was a JP office. I said, oh, okay, you know, I'm good. He says, no, come over here. You know, you'll love being a constable. And never, never ever did I envision being a cop, right? Because, I mean, it's a cop, right? No, 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 you don't understand. It's just a paper thing. You go on and knock on the door and just hand to him and walk away. Well, I went to the academy and, and, and he even furnished me a, a vehicle and all that, you know, so, and, and, you know, I needed the money, you know, it's economics, you know how that goes. And I came back, they had me crawling through a window, 
<laughs> and I was executing, yeah, I was executing all the mental health warrants. Oh man. You know? And, and, and that was, that was interesting doing that. And like within the same month I was evicting people and attaching people and putting them in jail over, you know, failure to answer interrogatories or whatever, some crazy, something simple as that. And then, uh, you know, all these and seizing property. And I talked to my constable and said, Hey, <laughs> I thought all you had to do is knock on a door and just walk <laughs> away. Well, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. I said, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. I got hooked. Yeah. I got hooked because I'm a people person, you know, and, and, you know, people say, and I've heard uh, stories about, don't, don't you tell me that you got into this to help people. Cause you're, you know, I hear some of the training academies, you know, the sergeants and all that, and like a drill, you know, team and the drill, drilling and instructor sergeant and all that. And, you know, it is why I got in, you know, to help people. And I felt, I felt like I was, okay, this is a bad thing. You know, you see a constable coming, probably not a good thing, right? I get that. But I get to talk to them, explain to them how this works and what they can do. You know, I'm not going to give them legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. But you, you, you have that, to have that feeling that that self-satisfaction of i did something to help someone you know even the kids even when i take you know as hard as it is to take a kid away from a parent i feel for the parent and man i tell you what i have i have i get nightmares over some of the things that, that we've dealt with you know uh, but it was all in the best interest of the child and so you know you you tend to deal with that you tend to deal with the reality that it was done for a reason, okay? It wasn't because, you know, one side just wanted to be mean to the other kind of thing or whatever. But um, there is a self-satisfaction. There's a satisfaction of being a public servant. You know, my mom was a public servant. You know, my brother was a public servant. I mean, you know, it's kind of in your blood, mm. you know? And, and I'll be public servant, but, you know, until the day I die. You know, because, you know, when, when my mom retired from the city, guess what she did? She went and volunteered at the at the senior activity <laughs> center and yeah. t- taught everybody how to dance and whatever, you know? Yeah. You, it's in your blood. You just do it. Yeah. You just go out and do it until you die, which is, you know, what happens, you know. But I being an elected official, I tell you, was a little bit scary at the very beginning. For one, is I didn't know how I was going to do centrally here in Austin. Um, Are you originally from the area? Yeah, I mean, okay, so I went to junior high here, uh, Allen Junior High, and I graduated from Johnson High School. Uh, but I grew up in the Corpus Christi area, and I say Corpus Christi because people don't know where Gregory Portland is, you know. So. <laughs> uh, but Gregory Portland is kind of where I grew up. And uh, Gregory was all Hispanic, and in Portland, it was all Anglo. You know, we had a school <laughs> right in the middle in the cornfield, and that's where we go. And so my dad was from Austin. He grew up in Austin, had all his family here in Austin, and my mom grew up over there. And he, My dad worked for the railroad, so he ended up over there. But when um, Hurricane Celia hit, then it was time to get uh, pack it up and leave. Mm. And so we moved to Austin in 1971. And that was probably the best thing we ever did, you know, because there, there are not a whole lot of opportunities out there in that area. There was a ton of opportunities here in Austin. Yeah. Uh, and it worked out for the best for me. So I didn't know how I was going to end up, you know, uh, in, in Precinct 5. I said, well, I'm sure this being a large office and, you know, going to have all these people run and all of that. And so, and, I, and then I, you know, back of my mind, well, I'm Hispanic, you know, in a, predominantly Anglo precinct. I don't know how I'm going to do, you know, but my consul, my predecessor is now tax assessor collector, Bruce Elfont. And, uh, he says, well, you'd be surprised at how many people, you know, in these clubs or in the political scene, you'd be surprised. And I think, you know, all these people he says, well, you know what? 
He said, I'm ready to move forward. I'm ready to move on. I'm going to be a tax assessor, deal with the voter registration. He loves voter registration stuff. <laughs> you, know, you know how he is, if you know Bruce. And, uh, and, and I know, you know, and I knew everything there is to know about the constable's office. I said, what the heck? We'll do it. So that first, um, first election, I had one opponent, and it was a libertarian opponent. Uh, and... Um, and, you know, if you want me to I'll tell you a short story about that yeah. later, because like a year and a half after my got elected, a year and a half later, there was a shooting downtown at the Omni Hotel. I don't know if you remember that. You know, it's been, you know, a few years back. And the shooter, I don't know what the problem was, but I was there two in the morning, whatever. And uh, a taxi driver came in and he shot and killed the taxi driver. Mm-hmm. A police department shows up. One police officer got in a shootout with this guy, the shooter, and um, and shot and killed him. And so next morning in the newspaper, I read about it. I heard about it in the news, but I read about it. And the police officer's name that shot and killed this shooter guy was Carlos Lopez. Same as mine, right? Oh, and it. so I was getting all these calls. It's like, hey, no, 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 no. I had nothing to do with that. Several calls, a text, I mean, everything. He's like, no, 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 it wasn't me, it wasn't me. News media says, we're on our way to do an interview with you on the shooting. It's, I said, I had nothing to do with that. He said, no, you don't understand. The guy that was shot and killed was your opponent. No way. I said, wait a minute. Are you telling me that the guy that was shot and killed was my opponent in the constables? Yeah, remember that libertarian that ran against you? Yeah, that was your opponent. I said, well, okay, so my opponent was shot and killed by Carlos Lopez. Is that right? Yes. That's scary, man. I was like, oh, my goodness. What do you think? Is that... That was like so s- weird. A setup? Almost? <laughs> no, I thought it was a joke. Is it a coincidence that they're named? It's a coincidence. It's a coincidence. That, coincidence. They, that a yeah. police officer that shot and killed... My opponent was Carlos Lopez. And uh, I said, well, I didn't. I said, well, what do you want to know? I said, well, I, we just want to know what you know about him. And I said, I never met the guy. You know, he evidently he ran again and ran for several offices and all that. So people joke about that and say, so that's why you don't have any more opponents, right? <laughs> wow. Because people, I was like, yeah, I was like, but that's a true story. I did not make that up. And I said, you can look, I have the article, you know. But uh, but that was my only opponent, and I have not had an opponent what? because of that. <laughs> right. I've not. I've been unopposed every time. Huh? Look, so, yeah, I was. I was saying <laughs> people must really like you here because you you know you always win. But I didn't know you didn't have an opponent. I, never, I had, and that's why I didn't come out in the ballot last time because if you're unopposed, they don't even put you on the ballot. Oh, so. Man. Yeah, I mean, the first time I actually got to vote for myself, which is very cool, you know, <laughs> very cool to see your name, like, wow. But, um, yeah, it's my third term unopposed. I mean, besides that one, uh, the first one. But, yeah, I've been so fortunate. And sure enough, what Bruce said, in the political circles, you're going to see that these are all your friends that you already know. And sure enough, it where they were. And I belong to several organizations, several clubs, you know, uh, Democratic club, political clubs and all that. And I, I know, I know just about every one of them, you know. Now you have some young folks that are coming up, yeah. coming up that I'm, I'm having to uh, introduce myself to, you know. But, um, but yeah, for the most part. And I think, I think we're doing a good job here, you know, with the domestic violence situation because I'm doing other things besides just, just constable stuff. Yeah. Your, your knowledge, you know, you've been in the, the criminal justice uh, area for, you know, 45 years. How have you seen the public perception and the public uh, reaction to police officers change? Has it gotten worse um, since you've been in the criminal justice world or has it gotten better? What have you noticed? My, from my perception, yeah, from my perception um, and from talking to folks around the state, it has gotten worse because obviously all the national, you know, attention, you know, George Floyd and all that. And, and, uh, 
or at least the, the police officers or the officers are feeling that it's gotten worse. You know, and so I am getting that from the state. Now, has it gotten worse for us? I, you know, I really don't don't see that. Now, now let me say this: when we had the protest down here, um, my office was tagged. You know, ACAB, all that stuff. You know, and uh, what, what what was the ACAB again? Um, all cops are bastards. Yeah. You know, and then there's a basically 13 and you know kill cops and stuff like that wow but they came and they spray painted my office because it's a it's a law enforcement office you know but um so next day after that and they they tagged our our trailer we had a trailer back there and i think josh took it and one one of our deputies and got it cleaned up and all that but the next day i get a call I say, hey, there's some DPS troopers because you know our governor's right behind us here, and we got all these troopers here. And, and one plain plain clothes car came and says, "There's a bunch of kids back here." I said, "What are you doing?" Well, we went up to them and say, "Hey, what are y'all doing here?" He says, "Well, we're cleaning up young kids." Wow. And so I said, "Well, did you get their name?" He says, yeah, I got, we got the, all their information. We had to because, I mean, they were out here doing that. I called her up, and uh, I said, hey, thank you for, for doing that. Thank you for cleaning up. He said, look, you know, we're, in, we're protesters. We're in March. We know we're all that. But people are coming, and they're, and they're vandalizing, and they're destroying our city that we love. And we don't, we don't like that. Mm. So... We got a crew together, and we got supplies and all that, and we're cleaning cleaning your building up uh, along with other governmental agencies that are out here, uh, buildings that are out here. And um, I said, "Wow!" And these are young kids. Yeah, that you makes know, me feel. And they've been, makes, makes me feel, feel good. good. Made me feel so good because I'm, you know, I'm with them. You know, and this may be an unpopular statement, you know, because I'm a cop, but I'm with the the, you know. I believe in Black Lives Matter. I believe in, you know, protests and all that kind of thing. I do. Yeah. I'm for them. And so I said, well, let me give you a donation. If you're going to go down 6th Street and clean that up, let me give you some money. Yeah. Go buy some supplies. That's I did. Awesome. That's great. I did. So, you know, it, it's it's our city. It's our people that are here that care about this city. But there's a social uh, injustice movement, you know, that, Needs to happen, in my opinion. Yeah. Do you, you know? think? Do you think the uh, the people who tagged the buildings were local? No, I don't, because I I kept hearing from folks, um, that like these kids that said, you know, these are not local folks; these are so people from out of out of town, coming in and and uh, and trying to destroy our city. Uh, and that's what they said. So I I tend to believe that 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 might be the case. That, that's I asked that for a reason because there's some thoughts that when that stuff was happening it was from people that weren't in and even lived in the state. Yeah, I've heard that from yeah. from other folks as well. You know, and I have a tendency to believe that. You know, um, and 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 you know, I I don't know what what their thought process of 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 all of that, but they're obviously bringing attention to to, right. to the to the issue. You think. You know, when when we were growing up, I feel like we were we were all raised to to show respect to you know, police officers and be respectful and mm-hmm. respect what they do. Do you feel like kids today or the younger generation were losing some of that respect, not just to police officers in general, but respect to um, the world or respect to our elders? Or do you feel like that's being lost as time goes on? I mean, there's always been a a, a a factor to, you know, they're teenagers that are always going to be against the cops no matter <laughs> what, you know. Uh, I mean, I have a nephew that was, you know, so-called gang and all that, and he ended up doing time. And, mm-hmm. you know, he would always tell me that they were, you know, well, they're you know, they're targeting us. You know, there's this, you know, just because the way that we dress and this and that, it was like, well, okay. You know, I believe that. And then, and then there were, of course, you know, he ended up in jail. I said, well, what happened to you? He says, well, 
the cops, they beat us up, you know. And he says, well, why? He says, well, because we were tagging this. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then we started running, and, and then they run after, you know, and they ran after us. And then when they caught up to us, you know, they kind of, and I think they broke one of my ribs, and, you know. So there's always, and that's, but that's years back, you know. And so it, there's always been that, okay, first of all. Uh, of, of rebellious. I mean, we were all there. We we're all kids. We we're all teenagers. We we're all the crazy, I was stupid. I, I was mean, a good kid. I know you didn't. I was I a good kid. <laughs> but, Still a kid. <laughs> but as it, I don't know. You know, the thing is that um, there is a generation there that um, that's a little bit more progressive and a little bit more um, um, insightful, and they're you know they're, they have this energy that is out there right now. Uh, but I still, I mean, there was this young, young kid who's, who's 10 years old, uh, and, uh, he has, he has, um, terminal cancer, right? And so he wanted to be deputized, you know, by me. And so a group of us went to, to, uh, Round Rock, it was about three or four agencies and deputized this young man. What his goal, he turned down. Uh, Disney could make make a wish foundation was going to take us into Disney. He says he turned that down. He says what I want to what's left what my whatever I have left, I want to spend meeting police officers because mm. I want to be a police officer when I, I wanted to be a police officer and I can't happen. So my goal is to get deputized by one hundred law enforcement agencies Man. here in Texas. Well. By the first the end of the first month, he already had two hundred. Okay, <laughs> but you know he we went and I, I I had him deputized and he was wearing his little sheriff uniform, little cowboy hat and everything. And he had two siblings, two two brothers. Who said, you know, he may not be able to be a peace officer, but we're going to carry the torch and we're going to be peace officers. We're going to be law enforcement. You know, yeah. and it just warms your heart. Yeah. You know, saying okay, there's still folks out there that. You know, and for the most part, I think the majority of the people that I know still respect law enforcement. Yeah. I, I believe so. Um, now, there's a lot of Austin bashing, you know, everywhere I go, oh, you're from Austin, you're you yeah. know, from that place, you know, and all that. So I get a lot of a lot of ribbon about that, um, you know, and there's signs and all that about Austin. And that every time I, I speak and go speak to someone is, uh, oh. You're one of those liberals from Austin, you know. So oh, I was like, wow. like, geez, and I can't even. So I can't even do a presentation without being labeled, you know. It's like one of them came up to me and said, "I heard you don't even carry a gun." It sounded just like that. <laughs> That's so funny. And I was like, "Well, I'm in a class with 200 cops. Why do I need a gun? Yeah. First of all." You know, but secondly, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I carry, I carry a firearm, you know, and, but even, but I'm, I'm curious and, and I'm, I'm actually, uh, honored that somebody's talking about me, you know, that, <laughs> you know, that they think I don't carry, you know, but for some, for someone to make a statement like that, yeah. you know, just tells you, you know, that if you're from Austin, you're one of those liberals that yeah. crazy liberals keep Austin awesome oh. weird. Yeah, well, got a little well, too weird. I huh? do, I do my my share with that. You know, but, <laughs> well, uh, to, to touch on that, yeah. you know, uh, you get a lot of people moving to Austin. That's making Austin even more Austin slash liberal. Yeah, and so uh, how do you 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 you're here all the time? We're from Houston. Yeah. How do you see that and the tech companies and everything moving in? It's really good for growth, but. Um, What's your opinion on that? Well, I, you know, it's hard to say what what their, um, you know, what their political, you know, views are or anything like that. But I can tell you that we have a, I'll give you an example. We have a disabled parking enforcement unit. I have two people that the commissioner's court approved. I have the disability community say, we have all these people that are parking in our places where we need to be parking at because we're disabled. And nobody cares about that. Can y'all do something about that? Said, well, yeah, let's go to commissioner's court and see if we can get some resources. And sure enough, they approved them. So we have deputy and, and a vehicle. Now, I'll have to say that that is my one uniform officer. I do have that one because it, it there you want to be visible, right? And so 
you got what's happening, what I see is all these out of state people coming in, parking in disabled parking. It's like, uh, what are you doing? I'm writing you a ticket. Are you kidding me? You know, I mean, that's the attitude. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Don't you have, you know, some other law enforcement duties to, you know, that you need to deal with? <laughs> I mean, you know, so that's kind of, an, I mean, that's one example of, of, out of staters that coming in here. I think like, it was worse there about <laughs> ticketing and stuff. I so I mean, okay. <laughs> but well, you know, right now we're not issuing anything, especially during the COVID, because the courts doesn't want to deal with it. And I so we're issuing warnings and all that. But we go up there and we're trying to we're trying to help the disability community, right? Because they have it's it to me it's 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 a right that you have. Yeah, they ought to be able to be able to go to the library or to a movie or go to the H-E-B. Ever try to go, and especially when it's raining, you know, and these folks are in a wheelchair. Yeah. <laughs> and then they park in their stripe zone where people don't understand that, that that's for the van to open up and get their wheelchair down. If they can't, then they can't get in or out. And so we're trying to educate as many people as we can. Uh, and so we were issuing tickets, you know, citations to folks. And then, of course, they get it dismissed once they get to the JP court, if you take this course and all this kind of stuff, which is fine by me. I don't care. I don't care about the fine. I don't care. As long as people started complying. We saw, we saw some, some compliance, mm-hmm. except for the out-of-state people. Uh, they just didn't get it. They couldn't understand what we were doing. And, uh, and now what's happening is people are using the hang tags, they have hang tags, but they don't belong to them. No, they're just they belong to grandma or grandpa, and they're using them for you know for convenience is all it is. Yeah. You know, so we're trying to catch. Them. I have a volunteer program, like you right now. If you guys want to be volunteers, I could I could swear you in, give you a badge, give you a ticket book. Go at it. God, that makes me want to do it so bad. Go at it. Can you, we, we how long does it take? <laughs> yeah. Can we get this wrapped up? Let's do it. Eight hour course. <laughs> oh, you lost me at the course. You lost me at the course. Never mind. <laughs> but, you know, we passed the law way back in. We, we, law enforcement folks are allowed to, to get volunteers to do it. I mean, at one point in time, I had a, over 100 volunteers. Wow. You know, of course, the COVID shut everything down. But uh, but we can start a program anytime we want again, you know. But but you know that's one example of what constables do because no one else does it. Yeah. No one else wants to do it. It's not law enforcing enough, you know, for people to do. They got other things, you know. That but that's that do. one, that small thing. It's, it's a small thing. But it's important though. It's, it's important to a person who's disabled yeah. and can get to ATB to just get a loaf of bread. Exactly. I mean, it'll take us, what, maybe 10, 15 minutes to run in. Now it'll take them 45 minutes to park and get out and hope they don't get run over because they're in a wheelchair, you know. And if not, they got to park way over there, you know, about, you know, several lanes down there and hope they don't get run over on the way into the, to the front of the store. Yeah. You know, I have my, as a matter of fact, my my clerk that uh, that handles all the disabled parking uh, is disabled herself. So, you know, it's a good program, but unfortunately it's still going on after, you know, almost 20 years, I think. Yeah. Something I want to get your opinion on, uh, we, we started talking about, you know, people coming to Austin and kind of the, the outside uh, lens of people looking into Austin. Um, there's a lot of cops leaving the profession. And I know you're a constable, it's a little different, but... What's your take on that? What yeah. do does the city of Austin do we have enough law enforcement officers to police effectively the city? Uh, I can tell you that that no we don't. I mean that's I think everyone knows that. Yeah. Uh, everyone knows the answer to that. Uh you got folks that um well first of all they were having a hard time filling the positions. You know, they got the sheriff's office that has a jail and all that, so they're trying to fill positions. And you have the Austin Police Department that takes care of the city and the sheriff takes care of the outer, you know, and then we deal with the courts and JPs and all that and whatever else we want to do. Uh, of course, Houston is different. Houston, I mean, they're like real cops up there. They like, I mean, they do, <laughs> they got SWAT, they got, you know, they got all everything. these tanks and all, you know, I, uh, they're what, different up what's there. What's the difference? <laughs> A little bigger? You know, it, they're, they're bigger, but they establish themselves as, um, you know, as, as law enforcement, as I don't want to say law enforcement, because we're all law enforcement, public, but in the public safety arena, which means, 
you know, they're out there doing traffic, they're out there doing narcotics, they're out there doing drug dogs, they're out there doing human trafficking, and and they're being funded to do so by the commissioner's court. Mm. Our commissioner's court, you know, I mean, they, they can't tell me what to do or what not to do. I'm elected official. But they have the funding. They can approve my budget or not approve my budget. So it kind of forces me to do what, you know, what I was budgeted to do, which is take care of the courts, okay, and all that. Now, getting back to your, your, your is there enough cops? Now, here's what, ha- what happened is, um, you know, well, they saw the, the, the funding issue at APD. They started getting short. There's a shortage, and then there's the cadet classes that were, you know, uh, postponed and so forth. So they're behind. APD, we had a meeting over here. APD says, uh, can we have a meeting with you, constables? All five constables. Yeah, sure. So just FYI, and we don't have a traffic enforcement unit anymore. Mm. Like, what? At all? Like, no, I mean, you know, we'll, we have people out there doing patrol and whatnot, but as far as enforcement, you know, and traffic and all that, we don't have one anymore. And so can you all do it? <laughs> everybody talks like that <laughs> and so and i'm already thinking well i'll do anything that the commissioners budget me to do you know i'm not afraid of work i'm not afraid of taking on projects you know and all that but we all, all have to be on the same page and the, and and the folks that approve my budget have to be in agreement with AP, uh, the city of Austin came to me one time and wanted me to do downtown enforcement of uh, parking. I said, first of all, it's a city ordinance, so I don't have any authority to enforce city ordinances. I can enforce state law. I can do that. But if you want me to do that, you have to go to my commissioners and say, I need this. We have to have an agreement. This is, and this, by the way, this is what it's going to cost you. Well, that never happened, right? And that was years, a few years back. Well, here we are again, uh, and APD is is short staffed, and they don't have the people. I mean, heck, I got calls coming left and right here for us to try to do off duty work for South by Southwest. Mm. You know, security work. They don't have enough people to do that, yeah, so they're reaching that. out to us. It's especially like, that, man. Mm, well, I, you know, and we're we're limited on what we you know can and can't do as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, we do off-duty work every once in a while, but it can't interfere with what we're doing. What, so, yeah. What was... Hey, what? Would, you, would you mind closing those? Not at all. Look, yeah, at, look at us. I know. I was going <laughs> to... That's bad. I was going to tell you after the podcast. Um, no. Oh, if that's you, per- all the way, yeah. Per- yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. You do that to begin with. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I thought it was going to get darker. It, like, well, the sun's well, setting. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. I was going to tell you that I'm, you're I'm gonna, stupid. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nope, don't laugh that hard. <laughs> <laughs> I know this doesn't happen in Houston, right? Yeah. Thanks, son. That's weird. All right. What was the thought behind cutting the budget? I think the narrative that I I heard in the and the and you know the news cycle was we're going to reallocate the funds to other places. Did that actually happen? Oh yeah, uh, you know, at the very beginning, of course, you know, you probably know as much as I do about this because you know, I not don't think that I have inside information. Uh, I, I or know, anything I like know that. you're the guy, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, but from listening to everyone talk, and there's cops talking and all that kind of thing, you know, and and actually, I found myself defending our city. Uh, to other folks around the state. I mean, I find myself doing that everywhere I went. Mm. You know, I said, well, wait a minute. You know, first of all, and again, I was just reading and all that, and people telling me, it says, you know, they didn't go away. These, 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 uh, you know, uh, I guess like the uh, labs and all that didn't go away. The money was reallocated, and so they moved it out, and they, you know, they, we're still doing it, but it's not in the police's budget. So in reality, there was only X amount of money that was reduced, and the cadet, the, what, what the real effect was, the cadet classes. Okay, those were like stopped. Okay? Now, those were stopped, and the reason, again, that I, that I got out of all that is because they wanted to review the curriculum. 
mm. that was being taught. What are we really, this is what I kept hearing, is what are we teaching our, our cadets? Because we're hearing things from cadets. This is like, you know, uh, training them how to, you know, aggressive tactics and and the things that they ought to be uh, learning. They're really, I, so there was all kinds of talk. You know, of course, I can't confirm any of that. But this is what I was hearing is that they did want to uh, to review that. And there was there was an independent study done and uh, I believe there was some uh, indicators that they were saying well we reviewed the videos and and yeah those probably need to be redone because there's like nothing but black people on there or whatever you know they were doing that oh, wow. and they were reviewing you know the tactics and what they were doing and and uh, so you know I again I don't have all the information so I can't with you know uh, talk about all the facts but that seemed to be what, what happened is they, they stopped the classes. And so as a result, I mean, you're, you know, all of a sudden you're, you got a couple hundred slots that you need filled. Yeah. And then there were rumors after the indictments happened, you know, the 19 officers were indicted. And, uh, and so, you know, like, we'll have a hundred people leave now and there's going to be all these retirements and all this. So I don't know if that's happened, but morale was not very high. Right. Do you see that bouncing back or how long is it going to take to get it? it what it looks like looking from an outsider looking Years. in, it looks like no one wants to be a police officer anymore is what it looks like. And it looks like we're, yeah. all, we're losing great talent too. The pay is, is good. I mean, yeah. I think the pay is really Really like, good. It's like eighty thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, it's it's, it's not bad, it? you know. Yeah. So folks, yeah. So folks that are looking for a job and they're like, yeah, I'll go ahead. I haven't had any any issues in, in hiring anybody. Mm. And I haven't had anybody leave. I mean, so but we're a little bit different, you know. Um, and and it's a it's a big family atmosphere here. You know, we all take care of each other. And and here recently, um, the commissioners voted to move the park rangers into my my department. Wow. You know, so now I have them commissioned as well. So, um, you know, we, we're, we're doing well, I mean, yeah. as far as that goes, but the other departments are having a hard time in filling their, their positions because I think there's some reluctance to go into law enforcement. Some folks that I've, that I've heard, you know, said, you know, it's too dangerous to be out there right now. I mean, Houston, uh, Dallas, and you know, San Antonio, I mean, all those places of large urban cities, it's very dangerous to be a police officer uh, anywhere. I think even in rural, so they say, well, rural areas, because next thing I do some, some teaching as well. So, well, rural, some people say, well, we're in a rural area. We don't have those kind of, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You have people moving into areas there that are anti-government folks, okay? Uh, they're militia folks. And they don't want to be bothered by law enforcement. So you go up there, try to serve them a little subpoena or whatever it is, and you might end up getting shot. Mm. So um, it's interesting because a, a, a lot of those those uh, folks, uh, their constitutionalists especially, uh, respect the constables. And I kept trying to figure I said, well, we'll talk to you, constable. We won't talk to that police officer. Well, why? That's because you're a constitutional uh, officer. And he's not. I, oh, okay. Is that a thing? Evidently, yes. I mean, it is true. It I mean, is true? It's, it's, I'm yeah. My office is a constitutional office, mm -hmm. and and so I'm elected per the Constitution, the Texas Constitution. Um, you got an APD officer, a police officer. That's a municipal. They're just they're not constitutional officers. You know, they're they're local municipal officers. So that was interesting, you know. I found that out by, you know, from <laughs> from some folks and and uh, and other constables are, are are sharing that with me as well. You know, yeah. when we go around the state, what's the biggest opportunity in regards to training? I mean, so I know y'all go to um, you know, like refresher trainings, you know, pre periodically throughout the year. Is there something, especially in your career, is there an area of focus that um, law enforcement communities throughout the state? are missing or lacking in an area of training that needs to be beefed up on? Well, I don't know if they're lacking uh, training in certain areas, but what I like to focus on is, is anything that deals with 
with stress that we deal with on a daily, daily basis. I mentioned de-escalation tactics, for example. Uh, you know, we can go out there, we can shoot, you know, we can wrestle with each other and do all that kind of fun stuff. But really and truly, uh, you know, the best weapon or the best training that you're going to get is how to deal with people mm. and how to stay safe. Uh, you know, I took some training and, and a, a buddy of mine at DPS that, that taught all FBI, all that is like, and, and my wife took that class, you know, oh. it's like, okay, you see danger coming, right? See danger coming. What do you do? Well, yeah, you, you go the other way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and now we're cops. We can't do that, you know. But as a, you know, but, but just thinking of 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 of, you know, just things that come naturally to you, uh, it, uh, as part of the training, how to talk to people, you know, and they talk about your uh, escalation and all that. We talk about your uh, your heart rate. And what happens when your heart rate reaches up and adrenaline hits in, you kind of go blind, mm. you know? And so what do you do? Well, you, you do your breathing techniques, you know? You do your breathing. So we learn how to breathe. And the more you breathe, the lower your, you know, your, your blood flow and all that's better, you know? And so you start, you know, you start thinking because it's all, yeah. you know, it's all physical stuff. I mean, it actually happens, you know, because, okay, now you got, so we go through all of that. You, the, that training is important for you to understand what your body's doing. Right. You know, when you're, cause I mean, you get in a situation and all of a sudden, whoosh, you know, your adrenaline goes up. You know, I can see how some of these things happen. Right. When people get hurt. If you don't know what you're doing. You know, there's some people just drop to the ground and they, you know, they're in a fetal position and they're, you know, I mean, they just, they don't know what they're doing, yeah. you know? So that type of training I think is important. Uh, uh, community policing, I think, is important. You know, I was on the, you know, on the board and a committee here with the mayor's committee on, on uh, you know, social injustice and all that when it first started and all. And we were talking about all the things that we need to do in, the, in our community and law enforcement that has started at the schools. Start talking to the kids about being police officers and what to do and what not to do and things like that and and store up and, and then hire police officers from within your community, you know, people that know one another in, in, in your neighborhood, trust each other and all that. Because yeah. there's a there's a huge community out there, Hispanic community, yeah. that's not very trusting right now, you know, because of immigration, because of being arrested, about, you know, all of that. You know, the more we interact with these folks, you know, the, the we, we do a lot of community events, you know, Josh and all that, and we do community events with the neighborhoods and so spanish speaking only and i speak spanish so i go out there and i talk to in my uniform you know i don't always wear your uniform but i wear a uniform for that so they can see that i'm a you know i'm a regular person in a uniform and 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 i look like them and i speak like them you know and we talk you know and all that and they feel comfortable you see and so you know those national night outs and all that's what it's for is to, to for people to feel comfortable and meet the neighbors and start talking to your neighbors. You know, don't be mistrusting your neighbors or thinking things and all that. You know, get to know them, you know. Right. And so that's what that's what the key is. I think community policing is 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 it's a big concept. It's been around for years. I mean, I think probably constables were the first community policing yeah. uh, cops that were out there, you know, because we all know each other in small communities. They all know each other, right? you know. And so you, you tend to treat folks a little differently, you know, in smaller communities. But it works in urban cities, you know, in neighborhoods. Right. You do it in a neighborhood at a neighborhood at a time. It works. It's just a matter of incorporating all that. Easier said than done sometimes. Though. Yeah. If there's a traumatic event that happens, you know, you're serving papers um, to a, a child attachment, like you were saying, do you allow or do you have to put that, deputy or that constable through a certain uh i don't know what it's like uh, do you give them a day off the day after if they deal with something traumatic or do they come right back because i think that's something else that's talked about is yeah you know police officers they're they they have this very stressful job right um and all peace officers in general right if you go knock on a door you don't know what's behind that door you know when you're behind. serving that paper in the event that something bad does happen is there a process that y'all have here um, 
that allows, you know, hey, you went through this bad event. Why don't you take a couple of days off and, and or go talk to this therapist or something? Do y'all do something like that? We do. Uh, we have the county. We're real fortunate that the county has a program uh, where you can go and get counseling and talk to folks after a uh, traumatic experience or whatever. We had a couple. We've had several, you know, throughout the years, of course. This last one was a suicide. We were at eviction. It was a suicide and so, you know, you run into those situations and it's very traumatic, you know, to, to run across something like that. Uh, and then you live with stuff like that for a long time, you know, and I, I even think it's like PTSD. I mean, we had a protective order, for example, we we're trying to serve on this individual and uh, we couldn't find him. And his, um, he had a place in Bastrop. So, hey, we can go to Bastrop. Let's go to Bastrop. But we were in Bastrop. He was over here um, at the comp Texas Comptroller's office stalking his ex-wife uh -huh. or soon-to-be ex-wife. And uh, she came out, and he stabbed her multiple times. They were in a parking lot. They chased him off and all that. And uh, we've been trying to serve this guy. You know, we try real hard because right? we're really good at what we do. We serve him right away. And so he ran to... Um, and Allie killed himself there, and then we started thinking, so, well, wait a minute. He had a son, his his 10-year-old son, Daniel, with him. And sure enough, you know, right around the corner was his, was his car, and the little boy was in the front seat with his throat slashed. So we had to deal with that. Okay. We had to deal with that. I had to deal with you know. Mm. And that was years ago. But to this day, it's just like yesterday. And so, and I train folks to understand how important it is to serve domestic violence protective orders and how important it is to attach children where they need to be. And so that's an example of, of one. Now, she survived. The wife survived. And so, but little D didn't. And he was trying to get his teenage daughter to go with him as well, and she refused. You know, she wouldn't go. But if she had gone, she'd probably be in the same situation. So you never know. And this guy didn't have no criminal history, right? No warrants. But he was abusive, and she had enough. And that's the most dangerous time for a female, or I say female, for a victim because it's it males are as well to leave and it's the most dangerous time when they leave because when they say if you leave me i'm gonna kill you or you'll never see your son again they mean it yeah. and so they you know i mean that's why we, we we're so close to to the uh you know family violence task force you know and try to do what we can to minimize any domestic violence that's so we started the men as allies program yeah. here and all here at precinct five right yeah no that's that community policing yeah goes against everything that i'm seeing around the state with officers leaving because you can't really effectively community police if you don't have enough people you know that's true. I mean, <laughs> right now it is so true. And, and you say, how long is it going to take to recover? I think it's going to take years to recover. Yeah. Years. Oh. Do you see it on the upside? Like, do you see it coming back, though? Right now, I don't feel like it is. At all. I don't see it. I mean, you know, I could be wrong about that. But me personally, I don't. I mean, because the reason I say that is because I'm getting calls from APD and saying, we need your help. And I said, okay, well, we're having discussions with our commissioners and our budget analysts and all that. All the constables are getting together. And it says, okay, now's the time because there's a budget coming up. Let's talk about this. And let the commissioners decide whether this is something that they want to invest in. Now, on, on the other side, and, and again, we're, we're elected officials. So the position of the elected officials is, look, we were elected to do this. And the, our community, our our folks out there are saying yeah okay i understand that a this is apd problem and they can't handle it but you're my elected official and you're a law enforcement officer and you need to protect me and you need to do something to help me out right so we're hearing that on one hand and on the other hand you got the budget issue 
And I don't blame folks for saying, hey, this is a city issue. They need to figure out a way to handle this. Because you start, you know, doing this, and they're going to want you to do that. And before you know it, you're doing all kinds of things. Now, you know, it, it may be that that we all decide as a group, as a team, as a Travis County team, saying, you know what, let's, this, this may not be a, a long-term solution, but for now, let's see what we can do. And maybe APD will come back up and, you know, uh, and at that point they can sustain it and all that. But maybe we can help out. But that's up to, again, that's up to the powers that be. Uh, I can't, you know, I can't pull my people from what they're doing to do traffic or whatever. I mean, we have our mission. You know, we have our, our duties, our assignments. And if they don't, we don't do that, I mean, I just taught, I just gave you examples of domestic violence, of how, how the dangerous that is. Mm. And we don't take care of, of business. And who is? Yeah. That's scary, man. Uh so you you got two years on left on this term? Three. I got three years left in this term, but so, you know, people are asking me, Are you gonna run against? Well, yeah, I gotta hit fifty. You gotta yeah. hit the fifty. So your mind is made up. You're going you're yeah, going for one sure, more. Sure, why not? You get know, that other badge, man. You got, I know. <laughs> hello. All these folks are giving me all these patches from all over the place and because uh, I'm fixing to take down my Russian patches that somebody brought me. Actually, Bruce bought me back. But um but yeah, folks, folks, I don't even collect them, but they just give them to me. <laughs> you look like you, you want like, to collect them though, because uh, they look like a collection. Oh, th- this is nothing. I mean, I've got rooms of, of this patches is that people get. <laughs> this is nothing. I'm telling you, I got hundreds of these patches that that I got from all over the place, and all all around the uh, the the actually the world because Australia or whatever because they have police Olympics and all that. They trade patches. Poli- uh, they trade. They have the police Olympics. <laughs> yeah, they trade patches. That's awesome. Uh, I had a. I wanted to get a story from you. So you mentioned way earlier in the podcast that you, uh, you feel like you make a difference, and that's why you like being here, especially in this department. So, um, well, in this precinct, right? Mm. Learning words today. Um, <laughs> so, do you have any uh, like a good example of uh, how you helped out? Like, like um, an instance of where you really ma- you felt like you made a difference, and something could have went horribly wrong. You know, you mentioned a, a very sad story earlier. Was there? Something that you got a hold of, uh, any story you actually choose. I just, I, I'm sure after how many forty five years, years, you probably have a, a good story you always go back to. Well, I mean, you know, there's there's several examples of 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 how each one of my programs touches people. You know, because um, I have several programs. You know, I mean, I have obviously the you know the the child attachments is is. And the protective orders are the most critical uh, orders that we execute here in this in his office. Um, you know, in an eviction case, uh, the lady, Mrs. Thiessen, uh, that she ended up passing away. Uh, you know, had an eviction uh, on her, and for some reason, uh, no one seemed to want to help her out, but. She was covered in roaches and everything, and and uh, when we went to move her out, she came out with a uh, with a knife. As a matter of fact, this is a knife, actual knife that we took from her. Oh. So she brought this knife out and says, "I've killed before, and I'll kill again." And she was doing this, and then she slashed her her her, uh, her hand, and now she's bleeding all over the place. You know, so. Um. You know, we, we we were finally able to subdue her, and and get her the help that she needed. Because I mean, obviously, you know, the adult protective services had been involved. Uh, you know, the fam she had no family, and I mean, she ended up getting the the care that she needed. Um, as a result of of that situation, you know, as an example. But no one was there for her before that, and so uh, the elderly. There are two things, and in, in, you know, three things. Uh, I mentioned the domestic violence that are that are heavy in my heart. Okay, uh, the elderly. No one, you know. I mean, we teamed up with the Meals and Wheels uh, and identified elderly folks in my precinct that are at risk you know i mean i had i had parents and they were sick and i took care of them all that 
but my dispatcher uh, had a dad who he couldn't get a hold of. He went and he found his dad in the backyard. He had fallen. He was there for 48 hours. And he died uh, later on. They took him to the hospital. He died of uh, dehydration and all kinds of issues. But there's no one there. And so so the elderly, is, I think, is someone that's, I mean, it's a growing population, especially right now for everyone. So we, we do checks on them. It doesn't take long at all for us to stop by, say, hey, Miss Deason, are you okay? And if you need something, we'll get a hold of Meals and Wheels and, and get your, you know, uh, your counselor or whatever to take care of whatever, you know. So we do that. We take care of seniors, and, we, and that happens all the time. I feel like that's an, a service that we don't have to be doing, but we can afford to do it because it doesn't take but a few minutes. Domestic violence, I can't, I can't end domestic violence. It'll always be there. It's been there, and it's always going to be there. But can we try to reduce it? Well, I don't know how to reduce it until unless I talk to the, and I say men because the men are usually the ones that are causing the problems. Okay, I can't reason with some of these men. They're too. They're they're already at that stage. But I can I can I can talk to the younger kids, uh, the younger children, and and teach them about what a healthy relationship looks like. Mm. Right? We can start there, and maybe there's hope. You know, so, you know, I'm a mentor. You know, and I mentored kids. I mentored one kid from the time he was six years old to he was sixteen years old. The same kid. But as one child, you know, but I'm going to do whatever I can. What's within my power to do. I mean, that's just my, these are my programs and they're working and they're self-sustaining and they don't cost a lot of money. But you know how much, you know, we're saving money by keeping these folks uh, safe and healthy because it'll cost the city otherwise, you know, if you put them in the hospital or whatever, you know, so... I feel like we're doing something there, and then with the young kids, I think we're we're helping. Some some folks, some agencies, some schools don't say, "Well, we don't want you to come over and talk about domestic violence," you know, because it. You know. Okay, can I talk to them about a healthy relationship? Oh yeah, you can talk about that. <laughs> okay, we'll do that. So we've done that, Travis County. We created a cartoon, you know about healthy relationships and a relationship is a four part series, but we interact with the kids. We go into river place in April and we're going to talk to the kids over, there. you know, just whatever we can do. I feel like I'm doing something. If I, I, whether, you know, I can't tell you whether this child that I just talked to, that's, you know, 11, 12 years old. I can't tell you how that's going to end up, but I'm hoping there's hope. And we're doing something rather than sitting here not doing anything. So, you know, it's it's programs like that, as a disabled parking, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a right that you have, you know, if you're disabled to be able to go and and and, and do the things that you and I can do without a problem, you know? Mm. Things like that. That that I think I, I I'm making a difference. Somewhat. I don't know. I don't know for what degree. But at least to one person, because I see people, people say, you're the gospel that had the disabled parking program, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You don't know what that means. You know, I had this, of course, they want to talk to you about that, you know, and all that. But that, you know, um, that's enough for me to know that I'm on the right track, you know. Mm. Or, the, or the mom will come after the presentation like, why? Well, man, I didn't know that you can get in trouble for that sexting thing, you know, and all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. But you know, so you know, it's those people, those parents that there is just an explanation that you're doing, that you're doing the right thing, you know. And of course, the rest of the stuff I think is my job. It's things my obligation. It's my responsibility to make sure we run an efficient office and that the taxpayers are getting their dollars worth. You know, that's why we want people to be working all the time. You know. So, well, Constable, to, to wrap this up, you wrap know, it up already. For, wow, well, I don't know That's how much big. time I don't know how much time you got, man. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, fine. Fine. I'm just um, kidding. I'm kidding. You, you know, 45 years. You're going for 50 years. That's that's an impressive career. How do you want the city of Austin, you know, Travis County, to remember? Like, what's your touch on the city? How do you want when people think of, of Constable Lopez? Yeah, your legacy. Oh. 
gosh. How do you want people to remember the work you've done and how you've impacted the community? Well, you know, I think that I'm hoping that that people would think of me as they thought of, of my mother, for example. My mother has been my inspiration, you know, and, and when she retired and when she left, there was so many people. I didn't realize, I thought it was just me that was special, but all these people that she, she spoke to were touched by her. And, um, you know, and she made a difference in all these people's lives. So, you know, if I can accomplish just a portion of something like that, you know, that people will say, you know, he was a pretty good constable. You know, he did, you know, because I want to be the best constable. When I was chief deputy, I was second in command. I want to be the best chief deputy. When I was a deputy, I want to be the best deputy that it was ever, you know. Sure. When I was a clerk, you know, I was like, I want to be the best clerk. I want to learn as much as I can, you know, and all that. So here I am as a constable. I just want to be the best constable that there ever was. And I want to leave this place better than it was when I got here, you know. So I just want people to say he was a good constable and he did everything that he could to make his community better. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, Constable Lopez, we greatly appreciate your time. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, and, and make sure you be hard on my brother. I'm always hard on your brother. Make sure you put him to work. He's he a good it. painter, by the way. Is he? Yeah. I've got one of his paintings. Yeah. You should oh, the painter painter. He's okay. Painter. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's really good. No, an artist. I, I taught him everything he knows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he didn't say that. However much you believe that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank and, you so uh, much for, for coming over here. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Bye.